worship. Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 75. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
Would you please remain standing as we unite in the historic confession of the Christian Church? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for prayer. grateful, O oh God, for the covenant relationship that you have, you have given us. We're grateful, O oh God, that you pursue us, you redeem us, and in the midst of our chaos, our darkness, and our void, even, O oh God, when we can't even sense it, you are there hovering around us. Your Spirit enables us at moments to see and to recognize your presence. But even in those moments, O oh God, where our heart and our soul feels empty, you are there. And we're very thankful that out of all the gifts that you have given us, including, O oh God, this covenant relationship that you have initiated deliberately, you have given us an opportunity to gather and worship. Not because you need it, but because we do. We need an interlude. We need a pause button in our lives where we are reminded of a bigger picture. Where we, oh God, can get a glimpse, although it is through veiled uh, means and cracked lenses, but we can get a glimpse of a kingdom that is bigger and more powerful than our own. A place and a time where we gather, where we are reminded that your kingdom doesn't bend to ours, but our kingdom bends towards yours. And so even in the midst of moments where we're reminded to enter into this place with thanksgiving, it's hard to do. Even where we are invited to serve and, and come before your presence with singing and gladness, it's very difficult. And so empower us through your Holy Spirit that we may be able to set aside those things that have captured our heart and to allow our heart to be captured by the one who created it. And whisper once again into our hearts and our souls that you are ours and we are yours. So that God, all glory would be yours. That your kingdom would grow even at the expense of our own. 
and that your name would be made great. And we'll be careful to do just that as we're reminded of that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 462. I invite you to stand as you are able and join us in singing. of God with his tithes and our offerings. Receive these, O oh God, your tithes and our offerings and allow them to be used in this church and multiplied for the furtherment of your kingdom and the hastening of your return. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. Amen.
standing as we read our, our passage of scripture from 1 Kings. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as I have said. But first, make me a little cake and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as her, he and her household, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, and neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you. We welcome you and uh, to our worship services, members and visitors alike, one more time, and, and uh, we're glad that you are with us. There's a red pew pad in the center aisle. Would you please take a moment to register your attendance and then pass it down and pass it back again. And, uh, and as the children come forward for the children's sermon, I invite you to greet each other and welcome them to our services today. <laughs> play golf like that? Maybe one day, right? All right. It rained. Did you get rained on? All right, perfect. Hey, uh, all right, I need some help. Um, whenever you're playing and you have to make a decision, how do you do it? What are some of the ways you might help you? Do you ever do uh, any, many, miny, mo? Do you know that one? Sometimes. How does that go? Any? We do, we do rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. So you do one, two, three, and then you pick one, right? How about you ever flip a coin? You ever, you ever do that? Once or twice? And the way you do flip a coin is like if it's tails, that means you do one thing. But if it's heads, it means something else. Yeah, but if you're choosing between some, something more than two. More than two, yeah, exactly right. So, so you just stumped me, you know? So uh, uh, that's right, if it's more than two, you can't use a coin. So maybe rock, paper, scissors might help or something. Well, you know, those are all good ways. I used to do that. Uh, I've got two brothers whenever we were growing up about your age and, and we were maybe playing football or baseball or, or having to uh, play hango seek or something like that and we had to pick who was going to be it or, or what some of the rules might be. We'd either flip a coin or the eeny mini miny mo and uh, or the rock paper scissors. But you know there's a way in the Bible that uh, do you think it has to do with flipping a coin? No? What about eeny mini miny mo? Is that in there? No? How about uh, rock, paper, scissors? You mean Jesus didn't do rock, paper, scissors? No. He didn't. Well, maybe he should have, right? That could have, what? He, oh, he asked the Lord. You're right. That's actually what he says. He, he talking about decisions and what to do. He, he actually says that if you can ask, what, what is it? You know that verse? Ask, seek, knock. It says if you ask, we'll know, right? It says if you seek, you'll find. And if you knock, the door will be open unto you. So instead of doing uh, flipping a coin or rock, paper, scissors, maybe on some of those really big decisions, what we could do is we could pray and ask God to help us. All right? So let's do that right now. Let's practice, aren't you ready? Oh, God, what we pray is uh, a couple of things. Is that, uh, one, um, as we grow older, what we want to do is be sensitive to, to your direction in our life. And so we want to pray for... Uh, for you to help us when it comes to making our decisions, e even at the age that we're in right now. And then at the same time, we want to pray, uh, we ask, Lord, for you to bless those who sit with me, watch over them, keep them safe. 
Help them as they grow to grow in, in every way imaginable. We also want them to grow in, in, in knowledge of you. So keep them safe, God. Bless their families. Bless them in the, in the things that they do. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.
Jack, our cross bearer, uh, when Jennifer was singing, when she got through singing, I, I asked him, I said, uh, can you do that? Can you sing like that? And there was this, that's the only way I feel like that all the time. So, uh, so thank you very much for leading us in worship. Let, let's pray together. Oh God, uh, as we continue to worship, uh, worship you in spirit and in truth, what we pray, Lord, is that through the, the reading and the hearing that the gospel comes. And so we open ourselves to that, oh God, uh, in, in our minds and in our hearts. Uh, we want to be fully present this morning uh, with you in hopes that the work of your spirit continues something inside of us that reflects the nature of Christ. And so again, we ask for that and we pray for that in the name of Christ. Amen. Last night, um, I was watching a, a movie. It was a World War II based movie. And right at the very end of the movie, uh, my daughter Caroline came in and she really wasn't paying attention. Uh, but, but maybe the last four or five minutes of the movie she caught. And there was this one scene where uh, inside the movie, depicting of the battle, where something happened that all of us would probably say that that's really not necessarily something that uh, that a Christian would do, and and so she asked the question. She said, "Why would somebody do that?" And so we talked about that for a little bit. But I've been reflecting on that question uh, this morning because that that question sits inside of a larger question, which is, how do people who follow Christ? How, how do we live? faithfully in a world where people uh, choose not to do that, to not live faithfully. Um, how do we do that? What does that look like? If we talk about that theologically, that, that revolves around the issue of holiness. Holiness uh, by nature, at least, when we look at the definitions in both the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, means to be set apart, to be separate from. And when we have this conversation of how to live faithfully in, a, in an unfaithful world, it, the, the pendulum swings all over the place to where either we're completely separate or maybe there are degrees of separation. And so often when we talk about this, uh, I can hear my grandmother's words whenever growing up as a, a, a young boy, she would give what I would call this church cliche that comes from the Bible to be in the world, but not of the world. You've heard it too, right? So you had a memo, right? So, and, and your grandmother used to tell you to be in the world, but not be of the world. So how do you do that? What does that look like? Maybe Elijah could help us again. Now, some of you know that last week we looked at Elijah's life and, and looked at it as a model or an example, something that we can learn from, and we'll do the same thing today, mainly directed around how to live faithfully in a world that sometimes does not. And so go back into your Old Testament history. Let me sort of help you dust some of that stuff off. Think back to the first patriarch, that's Abraham. Abraham has, uh, has a number of descendants. Eventually you get to Jacob and, and Jacob had a very large family of, inside of that family were some sons and their names are, that are, are used to, to, for, to describe the tribes of Israel. There were 12 of them and, and for a season they live in what is now modern day Israel and then they move south for a while in Egypt and they're in Egypt for uh, hundreds of years and, and it, it moves into a time of slavery for them and, and under the direction of someone, Moses, and his, his sidekick, Aaron, they lead the, those, those people out, those descendants out, and, and they sort of do an end around and going, into, uh, going back into what we call the promised land, back into Israel. And, and, and during this time of conquest, there, there are other leaders that take the reins. There, there's Joshua after Moses and, and, and Aaron, and then after Joshua, there are the judges, and, and we you know, might remember remember a handful of the more famous ones, people like Gideon, people like Deborah, like Samson, the last one who sort of bridges the gap between the season of the judges to the season of the kings is a guy named Samuel. Samuel's sort of like prophet and judge at the same time. But eventually Samuel dies and it moves the, the children of Israel into a time where they are, are ruled by kings. Now we know the first three kings and and the odds are we probably don't know many of the kings after them. We, we know the first one, Saul. 
And then after Saul, we know the two most famous kings, David and Solomon. One of the reasons why we know them, there's a great deal of information about them in the Bible, and it's what would be the golden time inside of Israel's history. The, all the tribes are united under one house of rule, David first, and then Solomon. And for about 80 years, both David and Solomon together for 80 years rule over, uh, rule over the kingdom of Israel. It's about 921 BC when Solomon dies. And, and then old ways resurface and, and, and the tribes split again. You have 10 that stay in the north. Geographically speaking, they are what we call the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. The two in the south are called the kingdom of Judah. And, and they, they, after this uh, uh, division, after Solomon, they, they aren't together again. Well, you have these kings in the north and kings in the south, and about 30 years after the time of Solomon, after his death, you get to where we are with Elijah. It's about 890 BC. And, and Elijah's a prophet. Now, the job of a prophet, what the, the, the way that job worked, I mean, you, you made your, you earned your living, you, you made your resources by relying on the generosity of other people, mainly the king. The way the job description worked uh, or what it would entail is that people who needed an answer on a big decision would go to you as the prophet and they would, they would state their case, they would ask their question and then the prophet would go uh, into a time of retreat and either offer, offer a sacrifice, a type of worship, would go into a season of prayer and discernment and then would get an answer from God and would come back and then give that answer to the king or the person that is, at, or the queen or the person who's asking uh, for the answer. And then you would receive a, a, an honorarium, you would receive some level of gift from those that were asking, uh, that would be how you, how you made your living. Well, for a prophet, the largest customer you had was the king or the queen. And the king, because the king would dictate behavior to some degree, uh, he or, or she, it would be the queen, would dictate policy. And, 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 and often the, whatever was going on in the life of the king or the queen would, would all, morally speaking, religiously speaking, would also play out into the life uh, of, of the average person. And so the king would often come to the prophet uh, and, and seek his, uh, seek a word from God and, and often that would end in some level of, of payment or honorarium for the prophet. Elijah, when we meet him, he is in a time of prayer and he gets an answer from God or a word from God and yet the king did not come to even ask a question. And the answer he, he receives from God is that he is to go to the king, mind you, who, who has not inquired anything, and tell the king he's causing all kinds of problems. He's, uh, he's making it difficult for people to live a faithful life. He's, uh, the, the waters are becoming muddied, uh, religiously speaking, spiritually speaking. And, and basically God, for, you know, Elijah has to go to the king and say, you're, you're messing it up here. Now, you got to get this picture. If you're a prophet and he is by far your largest client, how do you think this is going to play out for you? This is uh, financially, politically unwise. Really stupid. Because not only is he going to, to offend the king, he's going to lose his, his largest client. And on top of that, the odds are the king is going to want his head. And so now he's going to have to go into hiding. So not just is he going to lose his largest client, he's going to be under the witness protection agency. And so none of his clients are going to be able to seek him out. So Elijah is faced with Am I going to be faithful first? Doesn't have, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but he's faced with this question. What am I to do? If I'm faithful to what God asks of me, it, it's, uh, 
I'm in trouble. And what we discover first about Elijah is Elijah decides that he's going to be faithful regardless of the circumstances. Now, the reason why we stop here for a minute, if you want to be faithful in a world that is not, it first starts with this question. Are you going to be faithful? What Elijah is not doing is he's not waiting and see. He's not putting his toe into the waters, and if it's not too hot or too cold, then he'll put his, maybe, then he'll put his, his feet in the water, and, and again, if the temperature's okay, then he'll, he'll wade in knee high, and, and then if that's okay, then it'll be waist deep, and, and then after all that is okay, eventually he'll, he'll move into the pool. That's not what he's doing. And yet for so many of us, when we talk about faithful living, this is really the methodology that we adopt. You know, God, if, if it's gonna be okay, not too difficult, maybe make it a little easy, yeah, I'll, I'll be faithful, but now don't ask me to really make sacrifices. Don't, don't, don't expect me to actually deal with circumstances that are, that, 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 are, that are hardship. You have to see where he starts. He makes up his, his mind, I'm going to be faithful even if this costs me because it's definitely going to cost him financially, politically. He's going to be on the run. And what he doesn't have is, he, what is not given to him is, an, uh, is a vision to see how that's all going to play out. He doesn't know. He's faced with a decision. Elijah, are you going to be faithful to go and deliver my message to the king? That's all he knows. But the answer to the question for him is yes. Yes. If we want to be faithful in a world that often is not, you're going to have to get this question down first. Because what this does, this sends him down a path on a journey that uh, has a host of experiences and circumstances that are beyond his control. And, and I would even argue that if he had not settled that first question, he would definitely not be faithful too. This is not dip your toe in faithfulness. This is even if I don't know what the future will hold, I'm gonna be faithful. Now you have to see what happens. He begins this path of walking. He has no idea what, what it's going to entail. And, and, and true to what he thinks might, or what we think might happen is the king is upset and, and the king puts a bounty on his head and, and Elijah takes off running and he's hiding for a while. And, and uh, the next thing you know is that he's living in this basically uh, economic depression. It's the drought of all droughts. Which means if there's no water, then there's no crops, no crops, and the economy's not stimulated, and then it's, it's scarcity everywhere people look. And as you would imagine, he gets hungry, runs out of money. You know where his first level of help comes from? Ravens. I remember the first time I saw a raven up close and personal. It was at the Tower of London in England. You know what I've discovered about people? They don't go down to the neighborhood pet shop and buy a raven as a pet. Parakeet, maybe. Parrot, getting better. I mean, they're colorful, they can sing, they can whistle, they can repeat something. Not a raven. Ravens are unkept, they're, uh, they're heinous looking. They, they make this awful racket. 
I mean, they're by definition, uh, literally raven means to devour with greed. They're scavengers. And yet of all the ways that you would expect Elijah to find aid, it would not be from a raven. He receives help in the most unlikely of places. You know, I've seen that. In a, in a different appointment, in a different city, there, there was this guy in the community that uh, I'm not sure you could create a, uh, a reputation that is worse than his. In every way you can imagine. Uh, to, to his family, to his sibling, to, to his business partners, it, it did not matter. And it, and it went on for ages. You know what he'd do every Christmas? He would purchase about 100 bicycles and find the 100 most, the, the families that were in the greatest need and for their children, he would give a bicycle. to find aid in the most unlikely of places. That's what happens to Elijah. Ravens end up feeding him. Water, food. A little bit later, he, he leaves that area and, and he bumps into this widow. Now, this, this widow is not faring better than Elijah. She, she's pretty much at her wit's end. What we can at least draw from the text is that her son must be very young. Now, we do know that uh, she, with her, with her husband dying, she's a widow, that that's almost like a kiss of death in that day. Uh, there was not a lot of opportunity for, uh, for women in the workforce. There were not many social programs to help somebody who, who was in need. And, and if her son was older, maybe 9, 10, 11, he would have already started a trade, already be working. And so he would have added income into the family. So, so we can surmise that the child is very young and she's caring for him in an environment that, is, that the cards are stacked against her. And she meets uh, Elijah and they start carrying on this conversation and she begins to talk about some of the issues that are going on in her life. And of all things, Elijah asks her for some food. Well, John read the text to tell you how much food she has. In her cupboards is just a small amount. Flour, some oil. She can make just a little bit of bread and that's it. And she's resigned herself to the, to, to, to the fact that she's about to go home. She's going to use up all of her resources so that she and her son can have one more meal. And then she fully expects for them to die of starvation. And the audacity of someone to say, when you make some of that cake for you and your son, can you give me a little portion she ad adopts what I call the, the well but responses. Somebody says something, well, but you just don't know. Someone says, well, you know, this, this experience is going on in your life, but, but th th there's, there can be peace, well, but, I don't, you know. What about some joy? Well, but, give you all the reasons why not. And that happens. Things happen in our, in our world, in our life, and, and it's easy to look out and see all the reasons why not. All the wrongs with people. Just scarcity. It's not enough. People can't change. Just resign ourselves to the fact that... Uh, this is going to be it for us. That's where she's at. Elijah says, uh, don't be afraid. It's interesting that he starts there. H how much of our life do you think is dictated by fear? Probably more than we want to admit. 
And his first response is, uh, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and for your son. And then he says this, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. I mean, do you really believe that God can take care of your needs? I mean, really. I know it sounds good on Sunday morning and, and we know what we've learned in Sunday school lessons or at children's camp or, or VBS or you know, maybe what we see on Facebook or TV, but do you really believe it? So much so to the point that regardless of what future circumstances, and you might not ever know what they are. But you're willing to say and commit, I'm gonna be faithful. I mean, do we really trust God that way? Because that's what we're talking about. Faithful living, faith and trust, synonyms. I mean, do you really trust God for, for you and for your future? For your own life, for your children, for your, for, your, for your marriage, for your relationships, for your livelihood at work? You can just fill in the blank. Do you trust him? Or is it more, uh, God, I'm gonna stick my toe in here and as long as it's okay, then I'll put my foot in. And if that's okay, then I'll put my knee in. And if that's okay, then my waist, and then eventually I'll trust you. But you've got to, all this has got to play out first the way I want it. Then I'll trust. I wonder. You know, for Elijah... And this is the lesson for us. He decides on the front end, he's gonna be faithful. And he'll trust God in the circumstances. Can you be open to that? You know, there's something else in the text that's uh, fascinating to me. If we were to read on down, we'll know that uh, eventually Elijah becomes the source of life for a person who sees death as final. The widow's son becomes sick and he dies. And, and, and the widow, uh, she, she begins to think that God treats her the same way everybody else has. And Elijah says, hang on a second. And he goes up and he spends some time with the boy. And, and the net effect is that the boy is given back to his mother alive. And then the widow believes. What's fascinating to me is how many people do you think, just inside of our community, I'm not talking about our country, our state, the world, just inside of our community, how many people do you, do you know that when it comes to their life, they're just going through the motions? It's like they're dead already. In their marriage, at work, in their life, they're like, uh, oh, what's that show? The Walking Dead. Not zombies. But they're just, they're alive, but they're really dead. How many people you know like that? No hope. No peace. No joy. And it doesn't matter what happens or comes their way, every time they look out into what's out in front of them, it's, it's well, but. You 
You know they want more than anything else? Just hope. A life. Not just going through the motion, a life that has with it a level of fulfillment, a life that has a, a level of meaning to it. You know, for the widow, the source of life, it's Elijah. I wonder, for, for those uh, who regardless of what the future circumstances would be, if, if they were willing to make up their mind just and begin this process with God that says, God, I wanna be just like Elijah. I wanna be faithful. I wanna trust you in regardless of what happens going forward and, and then to walk that path. You don't think that'll be life for people? Sure it would. He's the source of life for one who thinks that death is final. Being faithful, it's more than just a personal issue. Being faithful not only affects your life, it affects the people around you. And it starts first not with just dipping your toe in, but on the front end, I'm gonna be committed. I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna be faithful. It's bigger than just you. It affects the world around you. So the question before the house is, can you trust? Can you trust even if you don't know how it plays out? That's what sits before you. Let us pray. Lord, we look at, uh, we make a comparison between Elijah and some of the other people in the text and you know, God, what we desire is to be like Elijah, but what we really are is more like the people in the text. So maybe the only thing that we can control is to create an environment inside of us that welcomes your presence so that what's created is this sense of self that's anchored in you. And that begins a level of resolve when it comes to how we'll approach the rest of our life. Lord, sometimes we get caught up in how to create that. Maybe if you could just look down into the depths of our souls, our hearts, and just see our desires. We trust that'll be enough. And we offer that to you this morning. In the name of Christ, amen. I wanna invite you, if you would, to take your hymn books and turn with me to hymn number 163, Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know. I invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to sing the first and the last. First and fourth, ask ye what great thing I know. Hymn number 163. <laughs>
invite you to receive this benediction. Now may the God of peace, the God of love, the God of mercy be with you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.